So I'm happy today to be joined by Elizabeth Davis, who is one of the editors of this exciting new project, EMDR and Creative Arts Therapies, which is a compendium volume from Rutledge, uh, who's one of the well-known publishers in the field. And uh, Elizabeth, first and foremost, welcome and congratulations to you and your co-editors on the new book. Thank you. Thank you. It's It's been three years coming. Can you believe it? Three years. I believe it. As an author of books, uh, especially when you go through a publisher, I don't think a lot of folks realize the length of the process, uh, getting everything edited and refined and proposed. And then you had the task of working with many contributors to bring this about. Right. 15 in all. So, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I'm proud to out myself as a contributor to this book. Uh, I have a chapter on dancing mindfulness and EMDR therapy, and then Irene Rodriguez and I co-authored a chapter on the field of expressive arts specifically and EMDR therapy. So uh, let's start from the beginning, even before the project. Uh, can you tell our audience a little bit about you and your journey with the fusion of creative arts and EMDR therapy? Sure. Um, well, it, it began, my journey began a long time ago, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, just to introduce who I am, um, I'm currently a director at Trauma Institute and Child Trauma Institute and an EMDR trainer and consultant. Uh, but my background goes way back in art. I, I really um, started becoming an artist when I was a child. I think that was one of the ways in which I learned to uh, process and regulate, and I didn't even know it then. And um, what got into the field of fine arts. So I went uh, on to become an artist, art photographer, got my master's in fine art, fine art photography, worked in the art field for a while, poor, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, realized that was probably not uh, the most sustainable direction um, if I wanted to have other things in my life. And so I went back to school and kind of in an almost, um, um, uh, you know, going against the grain of what I was taught as a fine artist, I went into the field of therapy and, and, and art therapy and went to a program at Nazareth College in Rochester. And so I uh, attended a very small art therapy program there that was, um, you know, it was okay. It had its qualities of, of richness around the art piece, but I would say in no way prepared me for the therapy field. Um, but um, I got out, uh, worked in a residential facility for youth for 15 years. That's what prepared me <laughs> for the therapy field and um, uh, found in that setting that art uh, was one of the few places many of the kiddos I worked with uh, could just come and be themselves and start uh, relaxing and, and expressing themselves because they didn't like necessarily individual therapy with their assigned counselors. So that's where it started uh, in terms of using, uh, really understanding the power of art and, and trauma, because of course they were all, um, had trauma histories. Sure. And it, trauma wasn't a big word at the time in the field, it was all behavioral and um, working from a, a creative arts perspective, only art therapist, you know, you, you're usually the only uh, creative mm -hmm. therapist. So. Uh, I got away with a lot. So I was able to do things other therapists couldn't do. Well, and, I would, oh, I didn't mean, no, go ahead. I just related big time that my very first internship site, I didn't have any formal training in expressive arts to speak of, but because I was a musician and a creative and, and had a lot of interest in learning more about it, I had a supervisor who I describe as was, was too burnt out to care at the time. And she's like, oh, you sing, you do art, you dance, do that with the kids. Totally yeah. makes sense, right? <laughs> that, that was I, much the blank check I was given. And then from there, I did want to get more formal training and development. And I'm, I'm very glad I did. 
Yeah, I think that the same applies where I was. There's so much tension working in a residential facility, as anybody out there knows who's done any time in one, right? That, um, uh, that a lot of helpless feelings, a lot of overcompensating through rules and and you know I, I worked in a place that restrained kids every day and so uh creative arts uh was just this little side corner closet area that i worked in and uh no windows you know but i got away with a, a lot because actually it was that uh, you can get them to engage we don't know how to <laughs> sure. and um that that was um what ensured my um and job security uh, as an art therapist. This was before licensure too uh, oh. in New York State. So at what point did EMDR come into your journey? About, uh, so uh, I would say about 10 years in, I got trained in trauma-focused CBT and I, I got a certificate in a trauma certificate from another place, not Trauma Institute, mm -hmm. and uh, and happened along EMDR. And a person in the field who was a trainer that had a creative background, I don't remember seeing your name out there at the time. You probably were there, but it was uh, Andrew Subert, actually, who had a background in music therapy. I thought, well, you know what? I want to learn EMDR, but I want to learn it from someone with a uh, creative background. And, you know, of course the creative part never came into it, but uh, <laughs> the training part, but that was okay. It, it got me through the door and um, and the facility, I, I was still working in residential and at the time trying, really having a hard time with the way, knowing about trauma, the way the facility was handling mm -hmm. trauma reactions and, kids who were incredibly triggered every day by um, their interactions with the staff and and the environment. And so I had to get out, you know, so and then um, EMDR really opened a door for understanding uh, trauma on a deeper level and how it could be treated. And I already had this tool chest of engagement tools around creative arts, and the two just started to weave together at that point. Yes. So I want to send a welcome to those of you who've popped in in the last few minutes. We've had a big uptake in our numbers, and I know a couple of you have just started to introduce yourself. So we'd like to welcome you again. I'm talking with Elizabeth Davis, who's one of the co-editors of the newly released EMDR and Creative Arts Therapies. So Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about the evolution of this book and how the team of the four of you got together and just anything you'd like to share about that process. Sure, sure. Um, I had a, a, a two day um, uh, training that I created um, and initially with Annie Monaco, who's one of the authors in the book. And now I do with Jen Marchand that preceded the book idea and um, was training. I think I was training um, in, um, it, was, it was Kansas or, I'm not sure. I actually it was during COVID. <laughs> it was right before COVID happened, right before COVID happened. And the training didn't actually happen. Um, and uh, Sherry Jacobs, one of the other editors, saw it and contacted me and called and said, Hey, you do this? And I said, Yeah, I do that. Do you do this? And this kind of uh, conversation started. It was the seeds of the idea of creating a book at the time, but uh, it was a long time after that that uh, we actually got to the point that we wrote the proposal and we brought in Jen Marchand and Jocelyn Fitzgerald. Um, Jocelyn's in Vancouver, Jen Marchand right now, she's in Ethiopia, uh, and Sherry Jacobs is in Kansas City. So we've worked from different points, you know, literally on the globe, not some of us never having seen each other in person um, on the book uh, right from the beginning of COVID uh, on through. And so it's been, that's how it started. And we came together. I think COVID brought people together in different ways too. And that really brought us together around a project that was really meaningful to us. 
So tell us a little bit about the different voices, perspectives, approaches. I mean, I could certainly speak for what I wrote at some point, but yeah, uh, yeah. great names in the EMDR and kind of larger art therapy field that are represented here. Yeah, we, we have quite a mix. Uh, we really wanted to have art therapy, expressive therapy, writing. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to limit it to people necessarily that were, you know, official licensed creative art therapist or certified expressive therapist. There's a few people in there that just had some great ideas. Yeah. Um, for Aaron Bice, for instance, she's just not a background necessarily in it, but had these a great idea around creative writing. And she, she works in a residential facility for youth. And so we wanted to just include voices. So we weren't going to try to be you know, licensed gatekeepers, certification gatekeepers here. We just wanted to have like uh, ideas inside the book that would spur people on. And so um, uh, we got together a group and the group formed and the, um, you were, were a natural part of the group. In fact, it was like, um, you know, this is a book you could have easily written easily, you know, on your own. And um, you gave me great advice from the beginning, too, on how to approach it. So I really appreciate that. I have to confess, years ago, I knew this book needed to be written. And you're right, like I did entertain, is this a book I want to write? Yet it just seemed such a good fit for reasons I'll talk about later that like you were doing it, being your long-standing leadership in this role and having like a role in the dissociation community and a role in EMDR community and art therapy. And I was happy to just kick back and write a chapter or two yeah. chapters as it were. And, and I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, when I got the book, cause I have just held it for the first time in my hands today. It, it arrived uh, via the mail. And to be holding a book from a major publisher that's primarily about EMDR and to see a chapter on dancing mindfulness, uh, which is something people laughed at me about many years ago when I started saying things like dancing mindfulness really can be an embodied expression of EMDR therapy. And that so much of EMDR therapy is about its roots in mindfulness and creativity and indigenous healing. and. So uh, to see this book come to life is amazing. And I was the second chapter that I wrote was with Irene Rodriguez and Irene and I are both registered expressive arts therapists. And a lot of just for listeners who aren't aware, a lot of what makes, so Elizabeth is an arse, as an arse, sorry, it's an arse. An arse. <laughs> so, you know, Elizabeth is an art therapist and the licensure she holds in New York is as a licensed creative arts therapist. And, you know, what a lot of people, and I'm glad we're going here with the conversation, don't realize is that there can be a lot of gatekeeping in this larger community around, well, you know, what's your license, what's your certification, what, what tribe or what brand do you belong to? Um, because one of the reasons I was never drawn to dance therapy or music therapy, even though those would have been the two natural fits for me, is I am very much an all of the above person. So when I found out that expressive arts therapy was a thing, that expressive arts therapy by its definition looks at the multimodal, I knew that that was very much a fit for me. And I really celebrate a project like this, like you said, where you just want people with good ideas yeah. to have a space to share those good ideas. And I would, I'm not certainly impugning that you can get advanced training in these fields yet, one of the rants and one of the issues I have with the field at large is that we can get too much into, you know, owning creativity. And that's something that to me was never meant to be owned. That's right. And I think creative, I mean, therapy, when it's, a, when people have shifts and breakthroughs, it's a creative process. Yeah. Um, uh, so it, we, you know, of course have people that have years and years in the field doing creative arts therapy and expressive arts therapy, uh, play therapy. Um, so there's there's a lot of expertise in there, but there's also the freshness of newness mm -hmm. and um, uh, also an invitation uh, for those who aren't formally trained to check it out, to be curious, um, to see what's possible. And um, it's great to really have guidance uh, and to know where to find the guidance 
um, that's how we really begin our journey as creative therapists anyway, is by ha having that invitation out there. And that's uh, a lot of what this book is about. I think it really is a, a marketed more to EMDR therapists, no matter where they are uh, in terms of their awareness of the creative therapies. Um, but of course, to uh, creative ther uh, art therapists and expressive therapists too. I, I'm so glad this book exists in the world and, you know, congratulate you and your Thank team you. bringing it out there. I did go ahead and I dropped in the chat and I'll put it in the show notes on the um, recording that will be available later on YouTube and here on Facebook, the website that they've set up for the book, which is www.emdrcat.com. I kind of like that emdrcat.com. EMDRcat, yeah. So if you think of emdrcat.com, that'll take you to a really great website that the team has set up for the book and information on, on where you can order it. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, and one of the reasons I'm here and so excited to be interviewing Elizabeth is, um, so, a little sidebar, if you are familiar with the new Netflix movie that is out called Stutz, in which Jonah Hill, the actor, interviews his therapist, and they really have more of a collaborative conversation than anything, I'm blessed that I'm having my own little mini version of that right now, because Elizabeth has been my EMDR therapist for the last six years. Remember, it was after the wow. 2015 election. <laughs> wow. And that was uh, a good reason to get into therapy, <laughs> to get back into therapy. In right. my case. And, and I just remember like how we connected, you know, and I, I okayed this with Elizabeth and in my new book, Dissociation Made Simple, that's coming out. Elizabeth also let me interview her and out her as my therapist, because, you know, we, we do have an interesting blended relationship at this point where, you know, it did start very therapist patient while we tested each other out then we would have realized we had so many shared professional interests now I think we're able to have multi-layered conversations at this point and uh it's it's a beautiful thing but I really want to speak to to endorse just how valuable Elizabeth being not just an art therapist a creative arts therapist but having a dissociation competency was really critical for me at the time in my life when I re-engaged with the MDR. Because uh, if you follow my work, I, I make no bones about the, or no secret about the fact being an EMDR client was how I got into being an EMDR therapist back in 2004. And I was not really formally engaged as an EMDR client for several years, even though I would do like spot checks here and there with colleagues and sought out some other forms of therapy, including expressive arts therapy. Uh, but after the 2016 election and having a pretty big dissociative meltdown as a result of it, I knew I needed to get back in specifically with the MDR. And at that point, I was very moved by what a lot of my colleagues were doing with intensive model EMDR. So my ability to go and travel out of town if I had to for a couple of days and work consecutively and uh, Child Trauma Institute where uh, Elizabeth works. I knew they had good reputation in that area. Uh, their director is a friend or their owner. So I knew I couldn't see him, but I, I was open to, you know, anyone else in that network. And uh, when I saw that Elizabeth had the combination of doing art therapy and EMDR and being very dissociation competent, I said, this is the person for me. And then Elizabeth, when I called you and we had kind of our screening call, then I realized you also knew about religious trauma and it's like, <laughs> bingo. <laughs> I think the universe- Lots of overlaps there, <laughs> for sure. Just, just very much a lot of overlaps. And something I could say as a client, who, who has received this is I adore the capacity, especially in intensive model EMDR to be able to take a break from the constant eye movements, from the constant being tapped and express something on the page or in the clay and know that I'm still in that mode of processing. Like it's not wasted work. Like I think a lot of people write off creative and expressive arts as being like, it's a nice adjunct to EMDR. Right. So much of what I do in my expressive arts work and this idea of process is that we're always in process. 
and that there is an overlap between the processing we do in EMDR and the processing that we do and when we create. Yes, absolutely. And it and, and the creative process so deepens the work. I think when it's allowed to be there, then there's the uh, the rest of your humanness that's allowed to show up and express. Uh, and you know, the MTR protocol is is a protocol, so it's it's very clinical and you know it's uh, very precise in a way, and it doesn't necessarily hold space for parts of yourself to really flex and move through it and deepen the meaning of what the process is about. And so art integrated into uh, EMDR, it kind of brings that he, it, human quality back to it. I think so much of therapy can get so stripped down to the bare bones clinical structure. And then it's, um, it's missing uh, its heart in a way. So uh that that piece um not it's not for everybody a lot of people don't want to do art when they do emdr you know obviously i offer it as an option but uh i think it really deepens the process all around every in every phase so especially as somebody who works a lot with people who dissociate in various levels and uh, once again, if you know me and you're watching this, you know, I don't make this assessment lightly that Elizabeth really knows what she's doing and has a beautiful understanding of dissociation and the dissociative experience. What do you see as the connection between I'm trying to think if I want to ask the question, like my different parts are giving me different ways to ask the question. What makes expressive arts interventions, creative arts interventions so valuable when you're working with dissociative experiences? I think it there's a there's so many different ways it can help. For one thing, it, it's external. Mm -hmm. So it invites an external focus, which it's creative. It's it's got the sensory quality, whatever you're using, paint or clay or um, you know, pastels or whatever it is, there's a that sensory quality that's inviting. It's 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 stimulating and soothing um, at the same time. It uh, is containing, it contains, it's a space that, that expresses part or parts um, and that uh, allows for it to be contained in that expression. Um, I think it does what great art does, you know, in general is it, you know, it is art after all. Um, and I think it provides another focal point. So a lot of times the face-to-face -face stuff intensity for um, uh, parts that are, you know, very untrusting of others or wary of others is too much. And so it allows for this space in between where two people can meet and, uh, and engage differently, which I think can let some of the pressure off. Um, so I, I think there's just a lot of different ways it can, and of course it's the expression itself that then can be so meaningful and can hold uh, a lot of the evolution of the um, processing in it, like an artifact even. Um, so there's, there's the doing and there's the piece, you know, so the piece can be really a valuable piece to reflect on. And then the process itself can, can also, I mean, it involves the body, you know, so the body comes in, the senses come in, it's activating more parts of the brain, uh, it's dual attention stimuli. <laughs> so there's that that's going on too. Um, and I, you know, just to add or to echo, uh, this first one's definitely an echo. I do think expressive work brings an element of humanness and creativity that sometimes gets missed in EMDR and similar modalities, if we're, especially if we're being so technical in the way that we do them. And yeah, I, I think you can do natural flow human EMDR even without expressive arts if, if you're committed to the relationship. Yet I think adding in expressive arts automatically adds another element of humanity, expression, creativity. And 
for folks with dissociative identities or dissociative experiences with younger parts, for us, that's the most, that's the way that makes the most sense. Yeah. To go yeah. into these concepts and to yeah. share our truth with people. I think it's it it provides a place for parts that can't talk <laughs> to express. It invites more parts of a person and developmentally and just uh, experientially. It in, invites more communication, uh, and that I think that's important too. It, sometimes when we process, we might not process as deep as we could because some parts aren't really uh, along, um, invited maybe, or even getting it, like, well, what's going on? And so uh, it really brings uh, a space that, you know, child parts can come, you know, the different parts can come that might be in hiding, or they, they don't have to be direct in their communication. And so it, it sometimes becomes the most, more important honestly, than the EMDR, <laughs> I want to say that, because art has been a form, way of processing through trauma since we've been human. And right. so it's just, we yeah. maybe don't understand or we take it for granted, so. To that point, one of the contributors in Dissociation Made Simple, who came forward as a former client of mine, who was, who saw my public call for participants and added her voice to, the contributors and dissociation made simple. And she gave me a good critique of what our therapy was like when the two of us were together. And the overall review is that the expressive arts made more of an impact than the EMDR yeah. for her as a person with dissociative experiences. And it's not the first time I've heard that. Um, so, th I mean, I, there's so much I could say and continue to guess yeah. about of just everything that the expressive and the creative arts can offer us. But I would say if you are an EMDR therapist and you're serious, about working with dissociation and working with it competently, a book like this can be va very valuable to add to your toolbox. Uh, again, we're here with Elizabeth, one of the co-editors of EMDR and Creative Arts Therapies, getting some basic training in an expressive or a creative arts modality, whether you're taking it as some kind of combined with the EMDR training or pursuing training in and of itself, it will enhance your competency as an EMDR therapist working with dissociation. And that's a point I emphasize my co-director of ICM's dissociation program, Amy Wagner, really emphasizes that you got to have something expressive along with you. Yeah. So anything else we need to touch on? Any burning desires to add to you that I didn't cover? I just think and create, you know, so often trauma has the impact of constructing creativity mm. and um, inviting it back in opens up one's, one's potential agency, their imagination for connect, reconnecting with themselves. And maybe that's the, the, a core piece for me is that the trauma actually, the, that, that bad stuff that's happened to us or the overwhelming stuff is also the source of so much creative energy, uh, potentially. And that when clients can connect back with their creative voices and connect the, the dots to this energy that's, that's, that's stuck in their bodies or in their minds or in different ways in them, in different parts, that um, it allows for them to get back control and to feel some power again to be able to, to really speak and maybe even advocate and express in ways that are powerful for others and for the society at large. And a lot of great art, I think, comes out of people who've experienced really bad things. And, and would it be here if it hadn't, you know, if they hadn't had those experiences and that connection to creativity? So well said. So once again, I want to give a plug for EMDR and creative arts therapies. I put the link in the uh, chat. If you're here joining us in real time on Institute for Creative Mindfulness, we will have this interview replaying on ICM that you can share. And I'll also put up a YouTube link for it so that you can share with people in your circles who are interested in the fusion of EMDR and all things creative and EMDR cat. You can think of 
EMDR cat. So emdrcat.com is the website that is set up for the book. And there's also information on ordering. So Elizabeth, please extend my congratulations to the others on your team. And uh, thank you for being here today to do the interview. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.